Hello, this is Professor Scott Applegate. Welcome to PSCES 6248 Introduction to Cyber Conflict. This is Unit 3, Lesson 1, Theories of Cyber Conflict. Agenda. In this lesson, we will discuss some of the theoretical concepts that Valeriano and Maness put forward to frame the current status of cyber conflict and what is shaping interactions between states in this domain. We will review the concepts of deterrence, rivalry, restraint, and regionalism, which form the core tenets of Valeriano and Maness's arguments founding the interactions we see today among nation states. We will explore the concepts of low-level competition and the use of proxies in cyber conflict. Finally, we will briefly review the assessment methodology that Valeriano and Maness used to test their theories. Introduction. In this lesson, we will begin to explore the theories and methods that Valeriano and Maness proposed in their book for analyzing cyber conflict. The authors provide us a theoretical framework for the analysis and prediction of cyber conflict in the international system. This theoretical framework is based on the concepts of rivalry, restraint, and regionalism. The concept of restraint is derived from, but not dependent on, deterrence theory. Based on this, we will spend some time exploring deterrence theory as well. Regionalism is based on traditional territorial pressures that have historically been the proximal cause of conflicts between states. Our authors have argued that at this point, the cyber strategies and analysis methodologies that exist are anti-theoretical. By this, they mean that these methods are neither deductive nor inductive in nature and are not useful in predicting the interactions that occur between nation states in the cyber domain. Current theories rely on the misapplication of basic international relations concepts, such as a flawed understanding or implementation of deterrence theory. Additionally, most seem focused on predicting the constant use of cyber tactics by states, rather than trying to understand the strategic interactions that might result in the use or restraint on the use of cyber tactics between nation states. The goal of theory is to generally explain the past and present and provide a framework for predicting future interactions according to a set of foundations and ideas that guide interpretation and investigation. Efforts to understand cyber conflict need to be theoretically driven and empirically grounded in evidence based on solid data that is subjected to rigorous and repeated analysis. Valeriano and Maness developed their theories of cyber conflict in both deductive and inductive fashions. Deductive reasoning starts with a theory or hypothesis and then uses observation to determine if the hypothesis correctly forecasts the outcome the theory predicts. Inductive reasoning starts with observations and attempts to discern a pattern and infer an explanation or theory. The authors then test the, these theories using available data sets and case studies. Rivalry. Rivalry is a long-standing conflict with a persistent enemy. Valeriano and Maness examine the interactions between rival states as these interactions are often the most contentious in the international system. The animosity of rivals often builds for centuries, to the point where a rival state is willing to hurt itself in order to hurt its rival even more. The authors argue that if the cyber domain is as dangerous as rhetoric dictates, then they should see evidence among rival states of malicious cyber activity with devastating effects. The fact that we have not seen such disruptive interactions lends weight to Valeriano and Manessa's theory of restraint, which we will cover later in this lesson. In particular, Valeriano and Maness focus on rival dyads. Rival dyads represent long-standing rivalries between states, often going back decades or even centuries. The authors identified 126 rival dyads and noted that of these 126 dyads, only 20 rival dyads had engaged in cyber conflict activities between 2001 and 2011. They also noted that the majority of rival dyads are neighbors, reinforcing the concept of regionalism that we will discuss later.
There are many examples of rival dyads, and most are relatively obvious given the geographic proximity and history between the states in question. Some, such as the rivalry between the United States and China, are less obvious, but are based on the desire for these states to project influence beyond their immediate sphere of control. The U.S. and China are both attempting to project influence throughout the Asia-Pacific region, and have thus developed a competitive relationship as they jockey to establish themselves as the regional hegemon. The concept of rivalry provides a solid foundational base for studying cyber conflict interactions among states as it bounds the problem to focus on the states most likely to engage in such activities. Deterrence. Deterrence is defined as the use of threats by one party to convince another party to refrain from initiating some course of action. Thomas Schelling argued in his 1966 classic work on deterrence that the concept of military strategy can no longer be defined as the science of military victory. Instead, he argued that military strategy was now equally, if not more, the art of coercion, of intimidation, and deterrence. Schelling states that the capacity to harm another state can be used as a motivating factor for the other state to avoid such harm and influence their behavior. To be coercive or deter another state, violence must be anticipated and avoidable by accommodation. It can therefore be summarized that the use of power to hurt as bargaining power is the foundation of deterrence theory and is most successful when it is held in reserve. A policy of deterrence can fit into two broad categories. One, preventing an armed attack against a state's own territory, known as direct deterrence, or two, preventing an armed attack against another state, known as extended deterrence. Situations of direct deterrence often occur when there is a territorial dispute between neighboring states in which major powers like the United States do not directly intervene. On the other hand, situations of extended deterrence often occur when a great power becomes involved. The overall goal of deterrence is to change behavior. Since the start of the Cold War, many misconstrue nuclear deterrence as the foundation for deterrence theory, believing that deterrence relies on the concept of mutual destruction to be successful. This is incorrect, and the concept of deterrence goes back hundreds of years. Classic deterrence theory simply relies on the concept of making an action by one party more costly than its possible benefits would warrant. Decision-making deterrence theory states that the consequences of war can be made so costly that only an irrational leader would consider war and attack as a viable option. This relies on several underlying assumptions and conditions. First, it assumes rationality on the part of both actors. Second, it relies on the conditions of information, access, capability, and credibility. In other words, an actor must identify and communicate to another actor the behavior they are trying to deter. The actor must demonstrate that they have the capability to respond in a painful or harmful way to the other actor if the behavior is engaged in. And finally, the actor must demonstrate that they are willing to respond to the behavior if it is engaged in or continued. In comparing how states have implemented deterrence in the traditional domains to how they have thus far been attempted in the cyber domain, we can see clear differences and mistakes. In the traditional domains, deterrence has focused on changing behavior or at least in maintaining the status quo. In the cyber domain, the focus has instead been centered around defense and preventing different types of malicious cyber activity rather than focusing on the behavior of the state actor in question. Additionally, in the cyber domain, most actors have been reluctant to message red lines or identify thresholds of behavior they are trying to prevent. This begs the question, how do you deter an adversary's actions if you are unwilling to identify the actions they are committing that you are attempting to deter? One notable exception to this has been the recent negotiations between the Obama administration and China in regards to the theft of intellectual property. For years, the United States engaged in a naming and shaming campaign against such actions. However, in 2015, the United States and China met and the U.S. clearly identified the theft of intellectual property through cyber espionage as being outside of the acceptable norms of international conduct, and it messaged its intent to respond to these types of acts. While China has never admitted any wrongdoing on their part, 
they have ceased engaging in this particular use of espionage against the U.S. since these negotiations took place. This event should be taken as a lesson learned that effective deterrence is possible in the cyber domain when traditional methods are employed. States must identify thresholds, message these thresholds, and demonstrate capability and resolve to act if these thresholds are violated. Cyber deterrence. Many, including Valeriano and Maness, have argued that deterrence theory cannot work effectively in the cyber domain. There are sound arguments on both sides of this issue that can be explored and discussed. On the positive side, one can point out that since deterrence applies in the physical world, it must also apply in the cyber world since this domain is inseparable from the physical domains. Valeriano and Maness have based their theory of restraint partially on deterrence theory, and one can see that some aspects of deterrence carry over to their theory. For example, the probability of direct conflict decreases between rival dyads with nuclear capability. One could foresee a similar outcome in the future between dyads with significant cyber capabilities. Currently, multi-domain deterrence appears prevalent among top-tier states. For example, the United States has noted that it reserves the right to respond with all elements of national power in the event of a cyber attack of significant consequences. Many have mistakenly thought that cyber deterrence requires a response in the cyber domain, but this is not remotely true as a strong kinetic capability would certainly deter cyber attacks if the actor is fearful of a kinetic response. On the negative side, Deterrence requires a demonstration of both capability and credibility, and this can be problematic since demonstrating capability can expose that capability to re-engineering by an adversary and can have an escalatory rather than deterrent effect. For example, the Stuxnet attack caused Iran to invest heavily in cyber capabilities and thus escalated competition in the cyber domain between the U.S. and Iran. Restraint. While Valeriano and Maness do not believe deterrence is an effective concept in cyber conflict, they do subscribe to a related concept called restraint. The perception the general public and others have of the cyber conflict domain is of an expanding range of possible harm and outcomes which will require new definitions of war and peace. The reality is much less impactful than the public case has made it out to be, with states tending to use cyber means in a restrained manner that falls far below the use of force or armed conflict. Based on this, there is no need to reconstruct or alter our concepts of war and peace, as these activities are occurring within the expected range of international interactions. The concept of restraint simply means that states are acting in reasonable ways within the cyber domain and are exercising common sense restrictions in their use of these new technologies. States are not going to conduct an act in cyberspace during peacetime that could be construed as an armed attack or a use of force because states are generally rational actors, and regardless of the potential difficulty in attribution, such an unwise action could entangle them in an armed conflict. States such as the U.S. have publicly noted that they reserve the right to respond with all elements of national power should an actor conduct a cyber attack of significant consequences against them. And why wouldn't they? The United States, like all states, has an inherent right to self-defense, and should someone conduct a significant attack against them, they will respond, proportionately, but not necessarily in kind. Thus, why would a rational state conduct an attack against the United States in cyberspace that could result in a kinetic response if they are not currently at war with the U.S.? It is therefore fairly obvious that actors in cyberspace will be restrained in their use of cyber weapons in order to avoid war, collateral damage, and economic retaliation which would potentially entangle a state in conflict or escalate a conflict beyond the control of a state's leadership. Cyber actions are expected to occur and even be tolerated, especially in the case of armed conflict, so long as they are used reasonably and in accordance with the tenets of international law. Rivals will likely tolerate cyber conflict operations so long as they do not lead to total war or massive loss of life. There are a number of factors that contribute to the use of restraint by rational actors. These include replication, collateral damage, globalization, emerging norms, conflict diffusion, and retaliation. 
We will discuss each of these in the following slides. One of the key factors leading to restraint is replication, or the danger that if a state makes use of a cyber tool, it will be copied and re-engineered. We have seen this to some extent with the Stuxnet worm, which appears to have been the basis for several follow-on tools. Some of these were undoubtedly created by the same original authoring state, but some were likely re-engineered variants by other states utilizing the modular framework to deliver other effects. A second factor is collateral damage. Many states fear to make use of cyber tools as it is difficult to predict possible second and third order effects. Even as heavily targeted as Stuxnet was, it still infected hundreds of thousands of other systems which were likely not intended to be part of the original target set. Globalization plays an increasingly important role, not just in cyber conflict, but in all forms of conflict. States are more interconnected than they ever have been in the past, and a devastating attack on one state can have severe consequences on other states interconnected through economic and social ties. Norms are shared standards of behavior, and just as there are norms in the other interactions between states, norms are emerging in the cyberspace domain as well. The establishment of norms does not require any formal treaties or agreements. The more states persist in avoiding devastating or disruptive attacks, the more of a normative basis for international interactions in cyberspace will emerge. Groups like the Government Group of Experts at the United Nations are exploring and codifying these emerging norms in cyberspace. Conflict diffusion is another factor leading to restraint in cyber conflict. Many states fear to use disruptive cyber tools as they may inadvertently drag other states into conflicts. Finally, there is also the threat of retaliation. As noted earlier, states like the U.S. have made it clear they are willing to retaliate against cyber attacks of significant consequence and that such retaliation is not limited to the cyber domain. Although cyber has been credited with giving smaller, insignificant states the ability to challenge larger states asymmetrically, this is not entirely true. Few such states would risk a kinetic response from the United States or Russia, and it is therefore unlikely that small states would attempt such an attack given the threat of retaliation. Even peer and near-peer states exercise restraint based partially on the threat of retaliation, along with the other factors we have explored. Regionalism. There is a broad perception that cyber attacks rapidly span the globe and that states or non-state actors will strike anywhere on the globe at a moment's notice. This has not been borne out in implementation, however. While it is possible to use cyber attacks to strike systems anywhere in the world, international cyber interactions are driven by the same issues that draw states into traditional conflicts. And the simple reality is that most conflicts are regional in nature, based on territorial disputes, competition for resources, and other pressures between neighboring states. Rivalry tends to drive adverse interactions in cyberspace, just as it does in the kinetic domains, and most rival interactions will have a regional context. For example, there will likely be very few adverse interactions between Vietnam and Argentina. These two states simply do not have much to compete over and are therefore unlikely to engage in conflict with each other, whether in the cyber or kinetic domains. Cyber interactions will often reflect local, regional, or political dynamics. Here you will find a list of conflicts that demonstrate the concept of regionalism at work in the cyber domain. You may wonder why the United States and China are included on this list, given that they are not really regional neighbors. While that is true, the U.S. has involved itself in the politics of the region for most of the last century, and as a result, has become deeply embroiled in the regional conflicts. With forces in Japan and Korea, and support for Taiwan, Singapore, and other Asia-Pacific nations, the United States has placed itself squarely in China's regional sphere of influence, and therefore cyber conflict is a natural outcome. Low-level competition. Contrary to the doom and gloom speeches about cyber Pearl Harbors and cyber 9-11s, 
The vast majority of international cyber interactions are most commonly low-level demonstrations of capability or intrusive espionage type activities. Many states may use low-level cyber operations as a form of deterrent messaging to demonstrate capability to other state actors. Low-level cyber operations can allow states to engage in bait and bleed strategies, causing the victim states to expend significant resources in response to minor provocations while allowing the initiating state to maintain plausible deniability. Cyber espionage. One of the most common forms of low-level competition in cyberspace is cyber espionage. The advent of the internet and the spread of information technology into almost every aspect of life has been incredibly beneficial, but it has also made espionage significantly easier, while at the same time dramatically lowering the risk. All cyber-capable states engage in some form of cyber espionage. Valeriano and Manest define cyber espionage as the use of dangerous and offensive intelligence measures in the cyber sphere of interaction. This definition leaves a lot to be desired, so we will use my definition, which defines cyber espionage as the use of computational technologies to gain critical information to give a state or non-state actor a strategic advantage over a competitor or adversary. While cyber espionage is a valid threat and has seen widespread usage, it is also driving record profits in the security industry. Victims and potential victims tend to overreact and overinvest in high-end security tools while ignoring basic security and cyber hygiene practices, which are not only far less expensive, but are also a necessary first step to preventing intrusions. Several other factors are also contributing to the rise of cyber espionage. States have a tendency to try to achieve balance or parity with each other. As one state engages in this behavior, rival states invest to develop similar capabilities. Smaller, weaker states are also looking at cyber capabilities as a means to offset conventional weaknesses in the kinetic domains. Finally, some states are using cyber espionage as a means to impose economic costs on their rivals, driving them to invest in broad, expensive security solutions in response to attempted intrusion. Cyber proxy battles, state cyber terrorism. Valeriano and Maness theorize that states may employ non-state actors as proxies to conduct acts of disruption or cyber terrorism. The 2007 DDoS attacks against Estonia could be considered a potential example of this type of activity. These attacks, which we will explore in depth later in the course, largely consisted of non-state actors conducting denial of service attacks against Estonia. Many believe these attacks were covertly directed by the Russian Federation. Valeriano and Manest define cyber terrorism as the use of computational technologies intended to disrupt and wreak havoc and fear in a targeted online population in order to change a situation in a targeted entity. We will use my definition of cyber terrorism as defined in Unit 1, Lesson 2. Cyber terrorism is the use of information systems to conduct or threaten to conduct violent criminal acts in order to induce a state of terror in the general public in the furtherance of a political, ideological, or religious agenda. Thus far, we have seen no real examples of successful cyber terrorist attacks. However, the threat of future attacks is certainly possible, especially if states provide technology or sponsorship for non-state groups to engage in these activities. There are a number of reasons why states might choose to make use of proxy actors in cyber conflict. Whether such usage is actually terrorism may be a debatable issue. The use of proxies allows states to potentially conduct provocative or punitive activities against another state with less threat of direct response or attribution. Such attacks may help states equalize capabilities with their rivals, impose costs or punishments on competitors, or impact the public will in the victim state. Assessment Methodology Valeriano and Maness have developed their theory of cyber conflict based on a number of factors which include regionalism, rivalry, and restraint. The authors then lay out nine hypotheses to guide their inquiry and list specific conditions which, if met, would falsify their theory. In order to test their theory, the authors created an exhaustive open-source database of all cyber incidents and disputes between states. 
this data set is online and you can actually explore and make use of it if you need to. Based on this data set, the authors evaluated their hypotheses in terms of methods, severity, regionalism, and impact. While you may not necessarily agree with every conclusion Valeriano and Menes reached, the most important aspects of their approach is their adherence to the scientific method and the transparency of their approach. This allows you as a fellow researcher to evaluate their method and results and draw your own conclusions. Conclusions. International cyber operations are political in that they are based on the demonstration of power around issues, spaces, or international concerns. Interstate rivals are the states most likely to experience cyber conflicts based on existing relationships and regional pressures. Restraint dynamics straightjacket cyber states into constrained actions in order to protect themselves from self-harm. Advanced cyber operations appear to be taboo and that they have the potential to unleash consequences disproportionate to their benefits. There is little evidence that cyber incidents and disputes are as serious as pundits make them out to be. While states should remain vigilant, there is a point where actions taken in protection actually damage the state. Targeted states are almost always as much at fault as the offender based on their poor defensive postures and inadequate cybersecurity practices. Cyber disputes are rare, and when they do happen, the impacts tend to be minimal. Evidence shows that most cyber incidents and disputes have no impact on state-to-state -state relations at the aggregate level. Incidents launched to coerce the target state to change its policy or behavior evoke significant and negative reactions. Cyber exchanges between great powers actually result in positive relations rather than further degenerative interactions. These exchanges fall below the normal range of operations. DDoS is the exception to this trend. This is Professor Scott Applegate. I hope you have enjoyed this week's lesson. Please feel free to contact me if you have any specific questions in regards to this lecture.